The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talk Give me faith, trust what you On the talk station, Faith Matters. And welcome to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Glad to have you along with us today. I'm Ben Ball along with the Reverend Robert Carnegie and Bishop Doc Loomis. And understand it's Robert's birthday as we record this today. Indeed. Happy birthday to no you. No way. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Oh, folks, Happy look in your camera birthday, right now. Dear Robert. Happy birthday to you. A beautiful chocolate cake with <laughs> FM, Faith Matters, on top of it. Thank you. <laughs> what is that old Tennessee Ernie Ford song? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. <laughs> Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company stove. <laughs> that well, cake is 8,612 calories. That's right. <laughs> by uh, the count over there at Harris Teeter. It's my birthday. There are no calories on Nobody birthdays. Nobody right? cares. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> it's my birthday. <laughs> And so, uh, thank so, you guys so and gals. Do, well, D- Doc is uh, responsible for that. So, oh, well, so, thank you, Doc. So. <laughs> well, and Diane over at Harris Teeter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's take a look at our first story today. And the first story actually comes from Charlotte. Uh, this is a this had made a brief moment in, in time in national mm-hmm. news. Uh, it was out of the Charlotte Observer. It says going against the grain, black church backs Trump for president. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump received praise at the Antioch Road to Glory International Ministries, a predominantly African-American church in Noda. I don't know what that is in Charlotte. But it's, uh, North Davidson it, is that what it said, is? Noda. Okay. They call it Noda. It's a, it's a sort of um, up-and-coming little community. It already is. It's already, it already came and <laughs> happened. <laughs> All right. Came and went. All right. So before, Still there. before the event began, a car driving by, dropping the F-bomb, and then uh, as people entering, uh, officers from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department were parked nearby. The speakers included Laura Trump, Donald Trump's daughter-in-law, who spoke to the character of the Trump's family, speaking about uh, the Eric Trump Foundation, et cetera, and St. Jude's uh, Children's Research Hospital donations. And according to most polls, Trump significantly trails a Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton with the African-American community. But here the speeches, though, focus on the historic support of African-American communities by the Republican Party and how Donald Trump's business experience can help promote business across the globe. And the speaker's making a number of things. The church's executive secretary says, Mr. Trump, you must stand with African-Americans and we must stand with you. Uh, and also, um, Roger said the Democrats made African Americans reliant on government handouts, which led to moral decay. The pastor, Thomas Rogers, said the blame is with the black community allowing it to happen. Uh, and he says we're no longer drinking the Democrat Kool-Aid. Uh, this is just a small, small group. But I I hear people like Herman Cain and others and the people who call into him as well saying there's more African Americans out there supporting Trump than anybody realizes, and then we'll answer the polls. I think you're going to see it in the in the in the uh, voting booth that a lot of people are just not mm-hmm. self-identifying as a Trump supporter, <laughs> and when they get into the to they just won't admit it, and when they get into the voting booth, they're going to probably pull for Trump. Just hold be, the nose, shut the curtain, do and, the thing, and yeah. do the thing, yeah. you know, and and. That's it. And when they do the posts, you know, the surveys outside the polling station, they're not going to say. But um, that's why the polls now are really, you don't put much stock in this stuff. It's just really hard to know where this thing's going. Well, that's been true for the last several elections. That's right. We've seen the polls Mm -hmm. really. Those uh, exit polls that they do. Right. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but is there is there a uh, possibility of of a, a Trump campaign appealing across these Demo- uh, uh, especially on economic lines? I mean, you just made a tax speech, uh, an economic speech this week where he talked about um, uh, being more tax equitable, reducing the number of brackets, et cetera, and making it so that what he said, 40 percent of Americans would pay zero tax. Mm-hmm. So is is he is that a possibility or is still the noise of the noise going to dominate this doc what do you think it depends how much time the media gives and how much time we give to communicating um the actual economic situation i mean the reality is we've been in almost you know eight years of barack obama and if you look at the last decade uh, for the for the average black American, he has he or she has lost in every single major economic category. There's almost not a single economic category you can look at. Seasonable adjusted uh, uh, rate of employment down mm-hmm. two to three percent. Blacks below the poverty line down two to three percent. Median no, up, income are, uh, below the poverty line. Up, below the yeah, b- yeah. below the poverty line went yeah. up. Yes, exactly. That strike that and reverse it. Uh, African Americans who are uh, their median incomes down what two three thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year. This is over eight or ten years when our income should be going up. Their median incomes are actually gone down from like thirty five to thirty two thousand dollars. Anybody, any African American who looks at the reality of the economics under Barack Obama and the failed policies of uh, well, of him, thank you very much, is going to have to say uh, the Democrats are taking us down a road to nowhere. I mean, it's just, it's bad. So I hope that this news gets out there. I think mm-hmm. the interview that Tavis Smiley did, uh, speaking of, you know, leading black communicators, Tavis Smiley did an interview with the Huffington Post, and he said it right there. Mm-hmm. He said, any African-American that looks at the economy right now knows, any African-American that's living in this economy knows that for the last eight years, we've gone downhill and fast. In in this in this particular thing, the Clinton campaign responded. It says, it's Clinton who has worked with mothers of the movement to curtail violence, who is supporting bipartisan criminal justice reform, and whose economic plans will bring good-paying jobs in North Carolina, said Dwayne Walker, pastor of Little Rock Amy Zion Church in Charlotte. And now here's, uh, here is a, uh, a person who is speaking for the Clinton campaign uh, saying, not addressing really the criminal stuff, but, but hitting on the buzzwords of uh, right. mothers of the movement. Mm. You know, it really is. And, and last week, Doc, you, you, hit a great, you made a great point about who's your daddy and how do you look at how do we, rec- how do we recover? How do we, mm-hmm. you know, g- government is growing at such a phenomenal rate right now. And it is statistically. We just added um, th- hundreds of thousands of new government jobs. I mean, the, the market is shifting. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we're getting to that kind of kind of tipping point where there where you know the number of government employees are are getting close to the place of of exceeding the number of private mm-hmm. employees. I mean, we're seeing this shift taking place, and so but the government relies on private income for its capacity to function, and but there's still this this um, belief that government can solve all these problems, that government creates jobs and creates opportunity, and therefore we need the bigger the government is, the better it is for the nation. And, and you go back to the, uh, the uh, uh, President Obama's speech of uh, you didn't create that. Exactly. You know, to, to see the philosophy mm. difference. So, so, you know, when you look at the platforms of the two parties, it becomes really clear which side of that, how, how that's shaking out. Um, Republicans have always tradi- traditionally believed that it's better to l- take the government's hands, a smaller impact, reduce the number of regulations, um, step back from it so that, that we can release the strength of the economy. Now, now- and, that's not, and that is not a popular position on in the democratic party right now it used to be now also in this article uh, when people saying well how can this church endorse a presidential candidate at the end of it they say they are uh, not a non-profit uh so they pay taxes yeah so so they don't have to abide by that uh, johnson amendment uh rule about uh, endorsing candidates from the pulpit, they can it, do that. Isn't so that interesting that yeah. that um, uh, Trump came out a, a few weeks ago, I guess, or last week? I can't remember when it was, but he said that he was going to repeal 
the Johnson Amendment. He was going to push to try to get that repealed so that churches could once again in the, be involved in the political process. In the meantime, the Christian Science Monitor with an article says, Pulpit Politics to Religious Leaders Influence con- Congregants' Political Views by Ben Rosen. He, and he writes in the opening paragraph, he says, The separation of church and state may be woven into the fabric of U.S. government, but in presidential <laughs> elections at least, American clergy members don't exactly uh, keep their church, uh, churches completely separate from the state, according to a Pew survey released Monday. The survey found that clergy members have not often brought politics into the pulpit in the last few months, yet when they have, religious leaders have focused on issues, including religious liberty and homosexuality, not, homosexuality, not only endorsements of candidates. Uh, again, this has been now, we've had several gener- a couple of generations anyway of the Johnson Amendment, so they've gotten used to that, I guess. Well, that's complying with the law. Mm-hmm. That complies with the law. And, and the hook, of course, as you pointed out, is that uh, most churches are, are tax-exempt organizations, whether mm-hmm. they're, they're you know, officially that through charter or whether just churches. Churches are tax-exempt automatically. So, um, but there are some that don't operate within that <laughs> because the hook to the law mm-hmm. is that you lose your tax exempt. They can take away your tax exempt status. That's the enforcement. That's yeah. the enforcement. And so this church doesn't operate by that. So, yeah. So, but, uh, but if, if we were not in that position, if you didn't have that, that hanging over your head, uh, I imagine churches would, but I don't you know. You only have I'm, to go back to the civil war. Yeah. I mean, during the civil war, you had Northern and Southern churches, not only preaching sermons in favor and not in favor of Lincoln, but they were actually publishing those sermons in the paper right. before mm-hmm. the law. Right. All right. Uh, more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. We're glad to have you joining us here on the program. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Cornegie, birthday boy, and also <laughs> Bishop Doc Lemus. And we'll have more to come in a moment. And thanks again for being with us here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, Bishop Doc Lewis and Reverend Robert Cornegy, as we take a look at another issue in the news uh, from this week. And this is from uh, taken from the Salt Lake Tribune. BYU athletes, LGBT uh, groups call for Big 12 to shun BYU. Uh, Brigham Young University's intolerance of homosexual behavior should keep the private school out of the Big 12, a group of national LGBT advocacy groups, says in a letter addressed to Big 12 Commissioner Bob uh, Bowsby. Uh, the Fox Sports uh, first reported Monday that athlete Ally and the Nas- athlete Ally and the National Center for Lesbian Rights sent the letter to Big 12 administrators that details what the coalition of LGBT awareness groups say are discriminatory practices, policies, and BYU's honor code. It, at at the, the crux of this is the honor code. I mean, and this isn't, uh, almost every school has an honor code. <laughs> some some may find it difficult to find, uh, but uh, uh, this is one that they have as being f- formed as a religious-based institution initially. <clears throat> Uh, but the Mormon in, Church, the, that's right. They the have, Mormon, it's their foundation. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and they have uh, the uh, part of the statement. BYU spokesperson Carl Jenkins responded to Salt Lake Tribune inquiries with an emailed statement. BYU welcomes as full members to the of the university community all whose conduct meets university standards. We are very clear and open about our honor code, which all students understand and commit to when they apply for admission. One stated sexual orientation is not an issue. So this is the honor code, not just for athletics, obviously, but for the entire student body. Um, I don't know how far this will go with the BYU with the Big Twelve uh, commissioners. I mean, they certainly enjoy having BYU in their in their ranks. But uh, Doc, what do you think of this whole uh, argument here? Oh, it will go a long way. You think so? Yes, yes. When uh, when having to go into the bathroom of the sex that's on your birth certificate keeps the All Star Game out of Charlotte you know where sports has gone. I mm-hmm. mean, sports is going to, sports is just floating along. Uh, it's like a mosh pit with, flo- with sports floating on the hands of the, whatever the zeitgeist is. And if the zeitgeist right now is tolerance and LGBTQ, 
R, mm-hmm. whatever all those letters are, then then sports has a really good chance of going along with it, just so as not to be offensive. I, I don't know what happens to these schools that have legitimate morality defined in things like honor codes anymore. I guess they'll have to be a... A, a, a new a new group called the Intolerant Ten or the Big Intolerant Ten for them to join because I I think there's a really good chance that the Big Twelve is is going to think long and hard about doing this. This is a uh, uh, the Big Twelve is also I mean East Carolina has been um, you know, trying trying to get into the Big Twelve <clears throat> as well too. I mean they're an important conference for athletics and so BYU uh, is one of the other last of the independents and they're looking uh, to perhaps join it. The BYU announced on July 19th that it has authorized Bowsby to begin searching for interested uh, schools to explore expansion from 10 to 12 or 14 schools. BYU has long stated its desire to join a Power 5 conference, and so they're looking for that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, some other schools are trying out uh, for that. But uh, in Monday's news, certainly cannot help BYU's cause that in that regard. The policy on diversity in Big 12 handbook states that it is the obligation of each member institution to refrain from discrimination prohibited by federal and state law and to demonstrate a commitment of to fair and equitable treatment of all student athletes and athletic department's personnel. Now, what what in the honor code would violate federal or state law? It's just that they they ask their students to refrain from premarital sex, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, right? And that and that where we what it says. That's what the code says. That's exactly right. Whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, and uh, I mean they as you as as was mentioned earlier that they've added in because it didn't state specifically homosexuality. They added that in, and that's when all this brouhaha began and so you know it's as uh, our our good friend mark Mm -hmm. woods would say this is where the church gets to be different than Mm -hmm. everybody else that this is where we we run into conflict with the way the world thinks and so if a if a a school a faith-based school has a code of conduct that is contrary to the way the world looks at things then the the school has a choice it either it either plays with the with the um the other team by their rules or mm-hmm. they create their own um conference or league or whatever you want to call it to uh, play other schools with with that same kind of um, mm-hmm. worldview so yeah what we're seeing is <laughs> you know we kind of lost our the the christian worldview has is no longer the dominant worldview in particularly in in athletics college and ma- you know major league athletics so um yeah we're just this is a consequence this is what happens so you have to make your choice BYU's, you BYU's honor code includes a section on homosexual behavior which uh, says the school will respond to homosexual behavior rather than to feelings or attraction so it's much more specific there. It's making note that same gender attraction is not an honor code violation, but acting upon those feelings is considered to be. The quote is, homosexual behavior is inappropriate and violates the honor code. Homosexual behavior includes not only sexual relations between members of the same sex, but all forms of physical intimacy that give expression to homosexual feelings. Uh, so PDA, public displays of affection, I guess. Uh, and this is, uh, this is that, what they have set out to, to honor the principles of their faith. Well, pardon the pun, they've driven that stake mm-hmm. in the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're going to have to, um, you know, whether they're going to move that stake or not is, is another question. You know, they're going to have to make that choice. And, and I know a lot of athletes – Love playing for BYU. I mean, they have a great athletic reputation, mm-hmm. and uh, um, but it will it, if they stick by this code, it's going to limit who they can play with. Mm-hmm. It's going to be like the Charlotte situation, right? Right. Right. So there are consequences. Ideas have consequences. This is one of the consequences. So, so yeah, I, I'm going to see who's going to write BYU and they guaranteed money off their schedule. I mean, that will be the. That'll be the one that, That's that right. makes a difference. Well, recruiting. Money this can size. affect recruiting, though. Yeah. Think about that. The, good, the thing that BYU has going for it is it's not a federally funded institution. Correct. It's still a private school. 
it does not receive federal funds, and that's how it can take a stand like this, which a lot of schools can't do. You know, the same situation really, it, you know, the, the same thing could be held against uh, the greatest football program in America, uh, Notre Dame, <laughs> who also has a very has a very similar mm-hmm. honor code uh, yeah. that the students sign when they come in. Um, and of course, they've been their football program has been independent for some time now, Atlantic Coast. But the the thing is that um, BYU the, the challenge for BYU is they're getting pressured now. There's so much money in collegiate sports, as we all know. Right. I mean, this is where those those TV times mm-hmm. uh, are where these schools make enormous. Some some schools in what is it now twenty and thirty percent of their total revenue coming from those athletic endeavors. Absolutely. And so, you know, if, you, if you're getting pushed out of a big conference uh, and you're not getting the prime TV places, then you're not getting the big bucks. And so they're in a – I think they're in – it's always – we talk about this every week. It's always follow the money. But this is a real financial squeeze, don't you guys think? I mean, that if they get into a Big 12, their revenues are going to go up significantly. I heard for East Carolina yeah. it's like two and a half uh, – uh, no, no, like $22 million dollars. Is uh, is how much it would that's mean. tuition there? No, <laughs> oh. is how much it would mean to East Carolina if, yeah. they, if they became part of the Big Twelve. Amazing, that's and that's you know, money 22. talks twenty two million dollars, and that's a small school that doesn't have near the mm-hmm. national reputation or championships that a school like BYU does. Right. I mean that's remarkable. I can't even imagine what BYU's income would be. Yeah, no, no. This is this is a this is a huge huge consideration, and uh, I pray that they will. You know, you choose your path, and uh, they, they're going to have to make a decision on this, which way they're going to go. And I think well, there, there is a battle here that needs to be fought. Yeah, I, and, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going to be surprised if, if the Big 12 doesn't go with them. I mean, they've got a lot of choices if they're only looking at a couple oh, of schools. Oh, Houston, Cincinnati, there's yeah, a lot of great right. Memphis, yeah. a lot of great schools out there. So no they're, they're no doubt that they could do that, and, and BYU would stay on the independent route for a while. Uh, but um, that may not be true uh, all the way down the line. It depends on, the, again, I think where the money talks. And the LGBT community also, uh, they, they, they control a well, lot of funds. Did you notice the end so. of the article, though, the last thing that got thrown in about the fact that the LDS church did not have African Americans serving mm-hmm. as right. elders, presidents, et cetera? And so now, and, and back in, was it like in the late 70s or something? 78. <clears throat> in the late 70s, they changed their position on that. Mm-hmm. They, they, that always gets thrown into the end. Like And, and mm-hmm. so from that, we can take heart that someday they'll change their position Good on this, this horrible injustice being done to lesbians yeah. and gays. Yeah, That's right. Amazing. But they did announce uh, just last year, I believe it was, talking about, uh, about reaching out uh, to the gay community in, in, in new fashion. And it not, not changing their position, but saying that, you know, the— the idea of worship is still open. <laughs> it's, that, so. it's the same thing that most churches are having to go through. Most, you know, Catholic church. I mean, the mm-hmm. Pope, he's dancing on that little thin line, you know, of how do you, how do we offer worship? How do we offer fellowship? And at the same time, hold our, our positions, mm-hmm. you know, what the Bible be true to the revelation of the Bible. How do you do that? And well, it's through love. That's how we do this. You know, we don't. And so they've got to figure that out. But 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 unfortunately, the militants don't don't play by those rules. But once again, uh, Robert, back to your point about the church losing influence here. Uh, right. And and when when money, if we want to uh, capture that as the root of evil, if money, manna, still gets involved here, is this um, this is going to continue? Uh, yeah. To be yeah. A, Sort well, you know, it's a fascinating thing that as the as the church loses influence, it also gets purified, and so we're going through this change in the way church operates, and uh, so it'll be interesting to watch it happen. Uh, Faith matters here on the talk station FM one hundred seven and AM twelve forty. I'm Ben Ball with Robert Cornegy and also Bishop Doc Loomis. We'll have more to come in a moment. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Thanks for uh, joining us here on uh, this uh, Sunday morning as we record this on the Wednesday. On Robert's birthday, too, by the way. I'm Ben Ball along with, we're going to say that every segment. Uh, 
And uh, Robert Cornegie, uh, Reverend Robert Cornegie from Chapel by the Sea with us, and also Bit Bishop Doc Loomis. And as we take a look at um, at uh, some of the stories, and as Doc goes to the window, <laughs> I don't know why, uh, but let's start with another story. Or actually, Robert, you sent this one to us. You've had some experience working in charities, uh, in international charities. Uh, World Vision loses two major donors after being accused of funneling millions to Hamas. This is from uh, the Christian Post. Uh, and uh, the article starts by saying the Christian charity World Vision has lost two of its biggest donors, Germany and Australia, government organizations, after the organization's Gaza Strip director was accused of diverting millions of dollars in cash to the Sunni Palestinian terrorist organization Hamas. Uh, why should we care about this, Robert? Well, number one, um, you know, World Vision is the elephant in the room. I mean, these guys are massive in, in, in relationship to all the other non-governmental organizations, mm -hmm. NGOs they're called. And, um, and it is a Christian organization, number two. So that it just in itself, mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, extortion and, and a misappropriation of funds and that kind of thing, then you're talking about a, a pretty big deal. But when it happens to the kind of the, as you know, they talk about the baby Huey right. of all the, right. uh, and most people have no idea <laughs> what I just referred to. But Certain decades. <laughs> who is <do>. Baby Huey. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is, this is important. And, we're, and World Vision, you know, they have, they, are very effective in both their um, non-governmental fundraising of, to the to churches mm -hmm. and to to uh, other, other sources than from the government. But they are experts in working with governments. On They've these been getting projects. international grants from well, they're, and they're very good. Mm -hmm. They're usually very good at this. They have the infrastructure. They have the manpower. They have the the cre credentials, if you will, as well as the credibility to be able to do these kind of things, these big, massive projects. I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars going mm -hmm. into these things and partnering with governments to make sure they come out. And particularly in this area where it comes to, you know, Palestinians and Israel and all the complications that layer on top of that. And it's just fascinating. I mean, this is this is scandalous, quite frankly, if this is is true. And and of course, you know the the uh, they're still doing kind of their due diligence in this, mm -hmm. but just the accusation has had an impact. And you know, government funders don't want to play around. So with, they've paused. Basically, they have paused. They haven't. Yeah, they haven't said we'll never fund again. They just said we're not. You're not going to get any more of our money right now till this thing gets straightened out. Uh, Doc, uh, what do you see on the on the international front? Is this going to be something that chills uh, donations to uh, World Vision or other groups like it? Well, there's two things we have to we have to put this in context of what's gone on in the Knesset recently mm -hmm. and the passing of the uh, NGO transparency law, which was um, which was really a divisive um, uh, battle in the Knesset over this law. And the idea was that um, the government wanted to find a way to expose or to bring to the light those NGOs that were receiving money from overseas. The idea was, look, we're Israel. We have enough issues with people out there. We don't want their NGOs coming in and manipulating our nation, manipulating mm -hmm. our government, manipulating our people for that matter. And so they, they wanted to pass this law. And the idea was if you receive 50 percent of your funding from overseas, then you have to expose it. Mm -hmm. Well, of the 25 or six organizations that, that fit that criteria, about 23 of them are very left-leaning. They're very liberal. Mm -hmm. And so it was taken that Israel was trying to take an anti-liberal stand, whereas organizations that were very pro-settlement and yet NGOs mm -hmm. did not fit the criteria. And so there's been a battle. So one could reasonably say this is Israel taking a guy in custody, creating a story, and making something up as a way of saying, see, we told you this transparency law was as important as we told you it was going to be. Now, the other side of it is just understanding Hamas, because we think of Hamas as a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. And while the Aquazam side of it, where the, I mean, the, the people that do the killing and make the missiles and shoot things into Israel all the time, is the other side of Hamas is, is the kinder, gentler humanitarian. Hamas, which is all humanitarian. And so there is a side of Hamas who now rules with Fatah, that Gaza Strip. There is a side of Hamas 
that is taking care of children and taking care of widows and taking care of orphans. But would, do we put that firewall up there between those two sides of uh, the organization any more than we put the firewall up in Planned Parenthood? But it's almost impossible to do that. They're so mm-hmm. integrated. And the challenge is not every country in the world feels that they're terrorist organizations. You go to Russia, you go to Sweden, they don't actually think Hamas is a terrorist organization. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen is probably the the countries that consider Hamas to be a terrorist organization are going to think twice about world vision in Gaza right now, Mm -hmm. and probably the others aren't. In Australia and Germany. Probably. Now, the the other side, uh, Robert, you've worked with NGOs, uh, is that what are they doing in Gaza? What is is this Christian charity doing there? I mean, they've been there for a while. Yeah, they have, and they have. You know, they have programs that they partner. Most most NGOs nowadays have have, don't do the projects themselves. They Mm -hmm. fund local entities within the organizations, and so you know, this is big business. This is so billions and billions of dollars all over the world. Mm -hmm. This this whole area of of um, aid, international aid, and um, yeah. When I was living in Switzerland for a number of years, and we would go every year to Geneva to the big international aid uh, fair. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was unbelievable who's there. Uh, anyway, and and World Vision has been has been right in the middle of it. They've been been kind of walking that line between the faith side and the secular side mm-hmm. because most governments try to keep the just do the social good works part of it right find the partners that do that thing and then we'll funnel you can be the funnel for the funding the channel for the funding and so that's what they do they manage the money but in some countries though are you know, almost entirely reliant on ngos I mean, well, look, that's look exactly haiti, right haiti right now. yeah that's right when we tried to we tried to go into mozambique and um, years ago, I went and did the advance work. And the, the, when we went into the port, the port government, government agency, said, you know, we're going to treat your relief supplies as cargo, as they, right. not as aid. And we're taxing it just like you're going to make a – and, you know, we, we just don't do that because mm-hmm. we're, we're giving this stuff away. But that's the, that's the way it is. It's become mm. a part of the economy. Mm-hmm. Aid has become a part of the economy, and these the guys. Some some people get really good, and we're playing the game and mm-hmm. uh, telling you what you want to hear. And all the time they're working deals, yeah, working yeah. deals. And so I'm not surprised that this might happen. You know, I just a little story, quick story. Um, gosh, twenty twenty years ago, <laughs> I was the on the board of an, a national organization called the um, Airdo. It's the Evangelical Relief and Development mm-hmm. Organizations of America, or really of the world. And um, so I was on that board, and and World Vision was a big part of that. And at that time, World Vision was was criticized for hiring non Christians mm-hmm. in these national offices, mm-hmm. and things started happening kind of like this on a smaller scale. but um, And so they changed their policies. But a lot of those people they hired 40 years ago, I mean, they've been in, in Gaza for 40 for years. Long, yeah. yeah. So a lot of the people they hired early on were still there. And they, it was just the new hires that they changed over. So, mm-hmm. so I, you know, you're going to have that kind of consequence when that happens. But pray for this organization because they do an amazing amount of good work. Mm-hmm. And so this really is um, – uh, really is a, a, a terrible thing to have, have been discovered, yeah, if it's true. And yeah. they're working on to make sure it's true. Yeah, prediction on what we're going to find in the end, if it ever gets published, is that this uh, this guy was feeding money into uh, into the benevolent side of Hamas. Israel, to make a political point, arrested him, published some kind of a confession, and is going to use that as a uh, uh, to, to broker a little bit more power in Israel, frankly. I think that's what we're going to find out. I think the guy's going to be exonerated. Well, I don't but, know. But it don't could you, be, look, that, that, that bright line between yeah. the humanitarian side and the military side is not bright. I mean, no, it's, 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 it's not very existent. porous. Absolutely. And so it, there's no doubt that if, if this money actually was sent in that way, a percentage of it got over to the other side. So, well, you well know. people in Israel, I think, have a reason to, to, to be skeptical of, uh, of, Absolutely. Uh, of, a, of an organization that has, has well, that Well, they do, but, but you know where it comes down, where the, where the rubber meets the road, is where you take your money that you're receiving from World Vision. And what they do is they, they do a lot of farming work, for example. Correct. So you hire a farmer 
who happens to be a Hamas militant, mm-hmm. but you're paying him a farmer's wage. Mm-hmm. Israel can, I'm not going to say rightly or wrongly, they would view that as being a payment into terror, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right. But he, he, the guy, he actually thinks he's, you know, planting fig trees in Gaza. Mm-hmm. All right, that's right. so. That's what that's. I think that's what we're going to find out to hide his be, rocket launcher. Is, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. boy. I tell you, that's a tangled web over there. Well, it is, and we're looking at a lot of people wondering about whether or not uh, they're going to continue to fund, even personally. You say uh, they get a lot of governmental money, but there's still a lot of some private churches, money too. A lot of yeah. private money. So, so uh, how? What do you look at as far as uh, where your money goes? Uh, well, they're they're they have a lot of integrity. And have they I really too, have respect they gotten, that organization. Have so, they gotten too big though? Yeah. So there, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to watch how they work through this. But uh, you know. Th- Typically, they are they are incredibly well managed organizations. So, we'll see how this works out. But we talk about governments getting too big. Can we can we well, say yeah, the same thing? It's true. Yeah, that's right. You know, you get that bureaucracy in there, mm-hmm. and it's hard to you know hold people accountable when you get that large. And that's the big problem with mm-hmm. with government, isn't it? You get that middle bureaucracy. You don't elect them; they're hired, and you know. So these uh, NGOs become de facto government agencies for some of these places where they, That's exactly they're right. working. Uh, we'll have more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with the Reverend Robert Cornegie and Bishop Doc Loomis. Final segment uh, today, want to bring up a North Carolina law. This is a, a, from ABC News. Uh, no quick ruling in North Carolina same-sex marriage lawsuit. A federal judge seems inclined to let a legal challenge continue. It's interesting how the lack of fact in that <laughs> sentence. No, a, a, a federal judge seems inclined to let a legal challenge continue over North Carolina's law, allowing magistrates to refuse to marry same-sex couples, but only if those suing can prove they have a right to file the legal action. U.S. District uh, Judge Max Coburn didn't rule immediately after Monday's hearing in Asheville, but seemed concerned about two issues. On one hand, he said no one had directly proven that they had been harmed by the law, uh, but he also uh, noted that in court administrators apparently allow magistrates to keep their objections secret so gay couples who appear before them on other matters wouldn't know about those objections. Lawyers for the state went to want Coburn to throw out the lawsuit. The judge said he found that their arguments persuasive, that gay couples couldn't say they were being harmed as taxpayers since the law requires another magistrate to be brought in for gay marriage duties. Everybody can get married, is the quote, and nobody is forced to marry anybody, says Coburn, an appointee of President Barack Obama, who was the first judge to strike down North Carolina's gay marriage law two years ago. So uh, it's in one in 20, 5% of magistrates are refusing to marry same-sex couples, but the, the way that the administrators are working it out is that they fill out the paperwork for that, and they just file that away and assign another magistrate. And some are saying, oh, that's being secretive about it. Well, the, I think it's, it's, a, it's not. It's secretive, but the but the line here is this is amazing. Listen to this: gay couples who come before a local judge for an eviction or a small claim have a right to know if that judge won't marry gays. Why? What? Why? What difference? Why? Is I mean, so if I come before a judge over a divorce, shouldn't I have a right to know if that judge went through a horrible divorce? If that judge was left by her husband, shouldn't I have a right to know whether that judge's kids ever did drugs if I show up on a drug charge? I mean, this is this is ludicrous that I have to know how a judge feels about. And frankly, just because I know how a judge feels about gay marriage does not tell me how the judge feels about gays. Right. Or or uh, or, you know, or another matter like a property dispute. I mean, that's what he's saying. If they if they appear before that same judge on an on another matter entirely, it has nothing to do with marriage. Right, claims. that's what I'm saying. And if you yeah. can say, well, I, he's throwing me, he's evicting me because I'm gay. I mean, seriously? Mm, this is this so, is we, we're In fact, the the idea of keeping that decision secret and just sending in another magistrate uh is 
seems to me to limit harm. It seems to be going exactly to to do so that there is not harm uh, right. to, to that individual, alleviating the opportunity that someone could have a bias. Yeah, but what what <laughs> but what's happening here is this is the LBGT crowd saying, "Show us who those people are." That's right. Why? Because then we're going to target them. Right. We're going to target them in elections. We're going to target them in the in the media. We're going to target them publicly. We're going to go to their homes and look. This is all. This is. We want to know the names. Give us the names. Give us the names. And this has been a, a drumbeat for that movement for as long as we've been around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lawyers for the two gay couples and one interracial couple suing to overturn the law say that the case should go forward because no taxpayer money should go to a judge who refuses to uphold the law. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 2015 that same-sex marriages are legal throughout the country. Uh, it's, it's, it, that's really dubious to say that taxpayer money is going one way or another. Magistrates are in North Carolina are are hired they're appointed by the superior court judge uh they basically work through in coordination with the clerk's office uh and they're really the the people's court i mean that's the lowest level of of court magistrate's court and their uh, money comes through the fees that people pay right. to be entertained in court yeah and to get marriage licenses correct. and to perform ceremonies yeah as last i heard is mm-hmm. that my wrong i on believe that, that's correct yeah, yeah. So. so it's not taxpayer money Per se. At least in no in no significant way, right? At all. So 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 the argument just seems to uh, to to fall on its face. However, it is the cause du jour. It is. That's exactly right. And this guy has already, you know, exposed his his position on. He's by. I mean, you know, it's pretty obvious that he's he's working an agenda right now. This judge, I hate to say it, but he's the guy two years ago that threw out our state law. Mm-hmm. Basically, and right. so you know he's he's he, got he, a uh, he's I'll got a pony though, in this race. Except his questioning here, though, does seem to be pretty unbiased. I mean, his questioning here is he's saying, "I'm not sure you have standing." We exactly, but until he got to that point, that yeah. there had you know, then he contradicted himself. So yeah, look, mm. <laughs> what. You don't think he contradicted no, himself? No, he, he may have, and I know where you're going with this, but yeah. I, I have a feeling that what he did was he threw down the gauntlet. He just said, right now, I don't know that you all have standing. In other words, I, you can't prove to me that you're hurt by this. So I'm thinking this. Now, if the only way back, they can you, prove it. Right, so if you come back to me and can prove that you've been hurt by it, well, then I'll have to reverse. I'll, then I'll have to move forward with it. Right. So now he has just given the marching orders to an agenda and said, find a way to be hurt. And I'll side with you. Which That's is his saying. statement saying you have to expose how these judges feel about gay sex right. or gay marriage or gay, whatever it is. But, and that's where they get the evidence to be able to prove that they've suffered. You know, it's your this. birthday, Rob. I just want to say I love your radio voice. <laughs> I wish I had that deep, resonant radio voice. It's taken me 68 years to develop this. A lot of cigarettes and booze, I'm thinking. No, you no, really, no. you are, you have that, that voice. It's just, it's so good to be here with you on your birthday. And, well, it's All a right. treat for me, too. <laughs> uh, you got another four and a half minutes here before you need to start doing that. I thought we needed to Are we stretch. stretching? <laughs> no, no. But, but uh, let, me, let me go back to this for a second. Because this, this, uh, this argument is, <clears throat> is not in a vacuum. This argument is in the backdrop of lots of other things that are going on in state law. I mean, we have um, the 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 religious objection uh, law. Uh, you have uh, again the whole gay marriage HB law, two. Two, HB two, even voter ID, <clears throat> any number of other things that the supposed, as the AP always point out, the Republican legislature, even though right. some Democrats also vote for these things, <laughs> um, uh, that they're passing, and they're always passing these laws that just that just can't hold up. And of course, we also have the backdrop of an attorney general. State Attorney General, who's a Democrat, who was elected, but is refusing to defend these laws. And, the, for example, the voter ID law doesn't want to appeal it. The same-sex uh, marriage uh, law did not choose to defend it. It required outside funding to do so. Uh, and it is... Uh, Which completely undermines their whole position on obeying the law <laughs> for the magistrate, right? If he can choose and pick... if the if the attorney general's state attorney general can pick and choose which laws he's going to afford, endorse, enforce, um, enforce, enforce, then magistrates, 
I mean, isn't that setting the example? And for they're not, and they're not doing that. I mean, no, they're, they're not because the the uh, the marriage still goes forth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this you know, the, the, I think the issue is really that that the uh, this momentum that the LGBT group activists have had mm-hmm. is pushing this this thing. And so, how do you you know, we're going to use a sports analogy. How do you stop the big mo? You know, how do you stop this momentum that's going and and our and is it real? And uh, so, you know, I don't know. We're gonna it's going to be the next year or so in court uh, jurisprudence. Prudence mm-hmm. is going to be a fascinating thing to watch. I know you're going to love it, Ben, because you love this yeah, yeah, stuff. stuff. But uh, lawyers for the Republican lawmakers, and uh, still in this article, and groups of magistrates question Cooper's commitment to defend the law and ask to be added to the fight of the lawsuit. So it's still it's still C. Cooper's department that's defending the law in this case. So they they're and they rightly so are questioning his commitment to that. Uh, they uh, the this Associated Press um, ran a story in April of 2015 saying that Cooper said he would veto the law if he were governor. Right, he would have vetoed that. And Coburn indicated that he would reject the intervention request because he thinks the Attorney General's lawyers are doing a good job. Yeah. That may be that may be the tip of the hand as much as any mm-hmm. tip of the hand about this about this story. So. Um, the the people in this uh, courtroom um, are are watching this uh, to play out in this courtroom, and now we'll see where it goes. There's again the backdrop of any number of other suits that are taking place about this in Missouri. That was struck down, and other laws, uh, re- religious objection laws mm-hmm. about uh, birth control and things like that. We've talked about those before. Uh, those are those are being challenged, and they may have to wait now for a court that is a eight person court still a four to four court to come down and decide this so how much does that put pressure on again the next appointee to the court which well, is that's exactly right becoming yeah. the big and, story and who will be doing the appointing right. is the question for the supreme court anyway yeah all right now you're at the point where you can do the stretch the downside is it being robert's birthday we spent a lot of time i wish we could have gotten to the story about donald trump stepping out of the race this morning oh no. but you know we'll get to that oh he didn't no. <laughs> i just know a couple of listeners right now who are... news flash <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> this is not war of the worlds folks so people don't. think he stepped in it but not out of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> stepped into something we are in interesting times and that's why now more than ever faith matters is your go-to show on sunday morning that's right Boy, i tell you if you want the answers on what's coming up because the, the government can't shut us down and they can't take away our tax exempt status because right. by gosh we're just a couple of knuckleheads <laughs> saying whatever we feel like and we get paid in cake <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> which we're enjoying just a moment Yes. Again, happy birthday, Robert. Thank you. Uh, That's going to wrap it up for this session of Faith Matters here on the Talk Station. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. production of the talk station.